Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Petra. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to exalt the name of the Lord in this place. We don't just worship when everything makes sense, right? We worship Him because of His character. Even if we don't understand, we follow Him and we worship Him because of who He is, because of His mercy, because of His goodness. Amen. So let's sing praises to the Lord this morning. Oh, it all
voices that you put inside. God, we lift them for your glory, for your fame in this place. Let's sing this together.
what bliss belongs to the one whose rebellion has been forgiven, those whose sins are covered by blood. For he wipes their slates clean and removes hypocrisy from their hearts. Before I confessed my sin, I kept it all inside. My dishonesty devastated my inner life. Then I finally admitted to you all my sins, refusing to hide them any longer. I said, my life-giving God, I will openly acknowledge to you everything that's inside. And you forgave me. All at once, the guilt of my sin washed away and all my pain disappeared. Lord, you are my secret hiding place, protecting me from these troubles, surrounding me with songs of gladness. Your joyous shouts of rescue release my breakthrough. So celebrate the goodness of God. He shows this kindness to everyone who is his. Go ahead, shout for joy, all you upright ones who want to please him. Amen. He brings us victory. He brings us freedom. Lord, we stand on that today. Lord, we know that you are victorious on your throne over sin and over darkness even today. Lord, and we sing this next song over our own lives, Lord, and even over anybody that's on our hearts this morning. So we bring this to you, Lord, and we declare the victory that you have in the name of Jesus.
that not because of what we've done for you you simply do it out of love and we're so grateful for that Lord you deserve the honor and the glory 
And it is that powerful name, that name of Jesus, that we are to share and give to others because Jesus is the one that brought us into freedom and he's the one that's going to bring them into freedom. So Lord, thank you that you're there for us each day. Give us the boldness to share your love with those that don't know you yet, that haven't, haven't heard the good news or haven't accepted the good news. <laughs> you are an amazing God. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. May it be so. May it be so. Well, good morning, church. It's good to celebrate the name of Jesus. Why don't you take a moment and greet those around you and say hello. Good morning, each of you. I'm Pastor Darrell. It's good to see your smiling faces on a rainy day, uh, but it's good to be together in the Lord. I want to welcome each of you for coming, and those of you joining us online, we're so glad that you're with us this morning. I'd like to welcome our guests as well, uh, whether you're in the, on campus in the room or you're in your living room online. Uh, if you could just take a moment, get out your phones, and, and uh, text the words Petra Guest to the number you see on the screen. Uh, we would love to know that you're here. Uh, answer a few of those questions. That helps us to get to know you better. Add a prayer request in there if you have one. Uh, we would love to pray with you and get to know you in that way this morning. And if you're in on campus, before you head out the door, and it's one of your first times here, please grab one of those orange bags that are hanging on the kiosks at different entrances. Uh, take one of those with, for your family as you head out the door this morning. Today we would like to uh, make you aware of an amazing local ministry that meets right here at Petra. Uh, check out this video. Psalm 1911 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. That is what the children at New Holland Release Time are doing, hiding God's word in their heart. Hello, my name is Deb Reimers and I am the coordinator for New Holland Release Time. I'm pleased to report that every year we register over 100 students from New Holland Elementary at our release time. These students come during the school day with the permission of their parents. They are transferred every Thursday by two church buses to Petra Church to have Bible lessons, prayer, and songs in two large groups for the first 20 minutes. Then they break into small groups where they recite, explain, and read Bible verses with a caring Christian adult. Their work earns them points towards awards and free summer Bible camp. Every school year is exciting for us. We have many students who pray the prayer of salvation and understand the step they are taking in their life. Here are four ways that you can support this program. One, pray for protection over the volunteers, ministry, and children. Two, volunteer. Be one of the caring Christian adults who listen to the children's memory work while developing a relationship with the children to be able to share Christ with them. Three, donate to support the ministry or to send a student to summer Bible camp. 10 students earn a free week at Bible camp every year. Four, send your children to participate in the release time program. Two thirds of our students are churched. If you have any questions about release time or would like to volunteer, please contact me. Thank you for your time and for all your church does for the release time program. We value your partnership in the ministry to our public school students. I encourage you to stop at a table in the lobby if you're interested at all. Uh, they've, been, they've been here for over 20 years. Uh, it's a great ministry, so if you have time to invest in that, that would be amazing. Uh, this morning, today is Sunday fun day for the youth. Oh, just because of the rain, I want to let you know it is still happening. Uh, but the, regist <clears throat> excuse me, the registration is in the cafe this morning instead of out in the field. As each Sunday, we want to thank you and, and praise you. Not praise you, but yeah, praise you. Thank you for your giving, just how you invest into this community each week. Uh, it is such a blessing. There are so many that are being blessed through you. There's many ways that you can give. You can drop it in the boxes in the back of the, back of the sanctuary. You can 
text Petra Give to the number on the screen, and uh, we encourage you to continue to do that, and we're so grateful for that. So this, mor- this morning, we also want to highlight uh, one of our Hopewell churches, or several of our Hopewell churches in Haiti. As you know, there was an uh, earthquake in Haiti, so we have some brothers and sisters down there that are struggling. And if you, we've uh, created a fund. If you want to give to the Haiti Disaster Relief or Disaster Fund, there as you see on the screen, it's the same way that we give to our missionaries. You, you text the word Petra Give to the number and look for the drop down list as you follow the prompts. Uh, we encourage you to not only give, but just to continue to pray for uh, the body of Christ in Haiti this morning. Uh, let's pray for our offering. Lord, we just sang a song about how you fight for us. You've parted the seas and and you uh, sacrificed yourself for us. So Lord, we we come to you right now. We ask that you would move some mountains and you would uh, just encourage the believers in Haiti as they are going through a struggle right now. And I pray for those churches that have lost family members and, and uh, congregants that, that have attend, been attending there that have died through the earthquake. And so, Lord, I pray that you would console them. You would just be with them. Or we pray that you would provide the finances to help uh, just rebuild some homes and churches that have fallen there in Haiti. Lord, we just lift the body of Christ around the world up to you. There is a lot going on in, in Haiti and Afghanistan and in other countries that underground church in China. Lord, we, we ask that you would be everywhere every day. Lord, and you, in your scriptures, you say that. You, you are with us every day. You're with us here in the States. You're with them in Haiti all at the same time, and we're so grateful for that. Lord, I thank you for uh, our student ministries. Lord, I pray that today as they do their fun day, and it's a little bit different plan, Lord, that they would just enjoy each other, get to make new friends, uh, and just have a good time this afternoon. We thank you for that opportunity to minister to that age group and to show love to them in, in many ways. Lord, this morning as, the, as we open up the word, we thank you for Pastor Brian, and we ask that your spirit would just work through him, that you would open our hearts to hear what you have to say for us this morning, continue to guide us step by step as we surrender to you. We're so grateful for how much you love us. And Lord, as we, as we give this morning, that you would take that finances and you would bless those in need. You would uh, strengthen those that are struggling. Uh, and Lord, give us wisdom on how to steward that. And we're so grateful for how you provide for each of us every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, welcome to Petra Church. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. The Edge and High School Ministries are kicking off the new year with special events today at Petra. Middle schoolers are invited to a Sunday fun day and high school students are having a Sunday hangout. Parents are encouraged to attend a half hour meeting at 1230 for important information about the year ahead. Guys Night Out is this Friday from six to 10. Hang out and have fun with volleyball, spike ball, archery tag, and ultimate frisbee. No signups, just show up. The second annual Lester Zimmerman Golf Outing is on Saturday morning, September 11th at the Fox Chase Golf Club in Stevens. Both men and women are invited. The cost of $90 includes breakfast and lunch. All proceeds will go to the Hopewell Network for Pastor Lester's support. High school students will enjoy an amazing weekend retreat at Camp Hebron from September 10th through the 12th. Register online by this Friday. Hey everyone, it's Caleb. I need your help. Our Christmas Eve, Good Friday and Easter services, and VBS are some of the greatest opportunities we have to share the gospel and bless our community. And let me tell you, these events take a ton of gifted volunteers. So this is a call to all of you creative people out there. If God has blessed you with creative gifts and you have a heart to see Him glorified, we would love to know about it. Maybe you play an instrument you don't normally see in the band on a Sunday morning. Maybe you're a gifted writer or poet and you haven't shared your work with anyone. Maybe you're an actor, a singer, a set decorator, a painter, photographer. Well, you get the picture. If you have creative gifts, we'd love to hear from you. 
You can do this by filling out this Creative Arts Interest Form, available around the campus and at the table in the atrium, or by texting Petra Arts to 84576. I'll be at a table in the atrium today to talk with you about using your creative talents here at Petra and to answer any questions you may have. We're excited to hear from you, so don't hesitate. Let us know your creative passion today. For the latest news at Petra, connect with us online, our apps, sign up for our e-bulletin, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and our Instagram. Pastor Brian Coles continues our Genesis series. Well, good morning, church. Uh, we have a busy day today. We've got a lot of things going on in the house. We are celebrating with our children's ministry and our student ministries as they're stepping up into their new grades and in some cases, new classrooms, in some cases, new ministries. And we have some events after the service for our student ministries. And it, it's just an important uh, day for us. There's a lot going on and we're excited about that. The summer is coming to a close, I know. I'm sorry, we're sneaking in our last vacation. School is uh, on the horizon, and it just it creates kind of a fury of activity over the next uh, few weeks. And so I'd just like to encourage you on behalf of our community, if you could just keep the community in prayer. There's a lot of things going on uh, over the next few weeks, and I want to encourage you just to be supporting one another uh, as we transition out of the summer. Uh, one of the things that you can also keep on, on, on your radar is coming up here very soon in a few weeks, we'll be uh, moving into our fall study. And we are really excited about our fall study. It's called The Essentials. It's really a recap of the core values of our church. And then uh, it's interesting how the core values of the church actually relate to, the, to your personal core values. And so how do you stay steady and grounded during uh, hectic times where you remind yourself of what's really, really important? And so I want to take just a, a moment or two. If you'll turn your attention to the screens, we want to show you a promo for The Essentials. Over the span of 39 years, the Petra community has seen over 2 million people walk through the doors of this church. We've sent out 38 long-term missionary families, over 140 short-term teams, and we've touched 88 countries on six continents. Just in the last 14 years, we've baptized 549 people and dedicated 448 children. We've been able to help our local community with the food bank and affordable housing, resettled half a dozen refugee families, We've seen addictions broken, marriages restored, and lives matured in Jesus. And every Sunday, we get to joyfully praise God for all He has done. But this didn't happen on accident. Like any solid house, the church needs a firm foundation. So what is Petra's foundation? Now that you're here, you're a part of our church family. What are the non-negotiable beliefs and values that make us who we are? Join us for an eight-week series as we examine the core values that shape our lives, families, community, and the world around us. This is what we believe. This is who we are. And you are a part of God's movement through us. These are the essentials. We are excited about our fall study, and as always, we take the fall study and we break uh, you down into these small groups. We ask you to get together with friends and family and to dig into the content uh, on your own during uh, that particular semester. And so if that's something that you're interested in doing and being a part of a, a small group, specifically if you would like to lead a small group, we would love to talk with you about that. Pastor Matt Coffin will actually be down in the front here after the service, and you can speak with him. He has some information he'd love to give you about about being a group leader for our Essentials Fall Study, so please make sure you speak with him after the service if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, can we go ahead and just pray? And we'll ask the Lord's uh, blessing here. Father, thank you so much for your goodness as we dig into a little bit of a heavy topic this morning, uh, the fall of man, the doctrine of the fall of man, how the Bible teaches about man's response to God's lordship over uh, his life and her life and the temptation of sin. Father, I pray that you would, you would speak your grace and your truth to us this morning. 
Father, we thank you for uh, the essentials that, is co- that are coming up, Lord, this series that we're going to get into. Lord, that you're going to remind us of what's truly important. It's going to keep us grounded, and, and we thank you for that. Father, I pray that, that you would just spur in each other's hearts here this morning to, to get together this fall, to be connected, uh, to stay united as we journey together in this life. We thank you for your word, and we, we just focus our hearts upon it this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome back to week two of the book of Genesis. This is a, a powerful book. It's a book of origins. It's the beginning. It tells us uh, how things were created, everything that you can see and smell and taste and touch. Uh, it talks about our planet, how it was created, how the universe was created, and ultimately how man and woman was create, were created. And it tells us how all of this uh, started. Uh, it says that not only uh, how things were started, but by whom they were started, that there is a knowable, caregiving, powerful God that created all things. And I was thinking over the last week or so about the first five words of God's Word, of the Bible, that, that in the beginning God created, right? You can count them. I counted them a few times to make sure I wasn't wrong. In the beginning God created. Now, I was just thinking of this. Man, these five words have shaped so many different parts of my life just in powerful ways. In the beginning, origins, where did it all come from? When did it start? In the beginning, God, the person, this God, this knowable, benevolent, benevolent loving creator, this is in the beginning, this, this start of all things, this God who is noble, created. Creation speaks to his character, that he's like an artist or a a craftsman. In the beginning, God, he's the author, right? It speaks to authority and rulership uh, over us and all the things that he has created. In the beginning, God created, and I view my life through that lens. I believe that uh, in the beginning, there was just God, that that's how things started out, that he's an eternal being. I believe that there was nothing, and I believe that this knowable, powerful, caregiving God began to create, that he's creating things, and he's still creating things, and we can watch him create things in your life and in my life. In the beginning, God uh, created. I've seen so much, uh, so much good and so much beauty come out of the people and their lives who believe in these five words, and I've seen so much destruction and so much suffering from the people who uh, reject them. We find out in, in Genesis chapter 1 that God is creating, and he kind of creates in, in successive complexities, right? So he, he does the sky, and he, and he makes land, and he makes water, but then he fills the sky, and he fills the land, and he fills the water, and then ultimately he creates uh, man. And, and man is kind of the pinnacle of his creation. He makes man, and he makes woman, and they are created to have fellowship with God and to rule over the creation. They are the most fascinating mixture of the material world and the spiritual world. They are, they are just interesting creatures, aren't they? Aren't we? Uh, that we? There is this animal instinct that lives inside of us, but ultimately there is this spiritual reality that is alive uh, within us. It's this beautiful thing. Just think of creation in your mind, the Garden of Eden, all of the provision, all of the beauty, and Adam and Eve, and their fellowshipping with God. It's just beautiful. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, it says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. In chapter 2, we learn about the day of rest. We learn more about this pinnacle of creation, uh, man and woman, the provision of the garden. Actually, chapter 2 goes through uh, in great detail how God, every time there's a point of need, there's a provision. God is just providing everything that humanity needs. He also gives the provision of marriage, right? So we have this relationship really with creation, with, with the food and, and with this river that's coming through the garden. We have, we have fellowship with God because we're in his presence, and now marriage, we have a uh, union with one another. And so, again, all of our needs are being met in the garden. And I want to I wanna take us to the very last verse before we get into chapter 3. I want the very last verse of chapter 2, it says this, Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. They were both naked and they felt no 
shame. It's real easy to kind of read that verse and, and skip over it or gloss over, but this is a really important verse. It's not just uh, the symbolism of this physical nakedness, but, but it's really a, a spiritual reality as well, that there is, there's just full disclosure and explosion. Like they just, I'm just, everything's just out there. There's nothing in between me and you. There's nothing in between me and God. There's no shame Right? Like there's just no awkwardness. There's, there's no, I don't have to try to figure out what your motives are. Like, like we're just good and I'm good with God. There's nothing in between us that they're naked, that they're, they're, they're exposed and it's okay. It's not weird in the way that we think of it. And it's even a spiritual exposure. They're just living in the light. Like there's just, there's, you don't have to hide. There's nothing to hide for. And there's no shame. What a beautiful picture of, of their existence. These are incredible final words of chapter 2. Today we're going to be talking about the, the fall of man. It's a little bit of a heavy topic. It's the, the doctrine of the fall of man. It's, it's the reality of, of the, the, the world that we live in outside of Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you're, you're living in a fallen world. Uh, Jesus is constantly trying to recreate and repurpose and renew. But, but really, if you look around, things are pretty messed up, aren't they? Don't look around right now. You'll be like, you. No, don't do that. Okay. Things are pretty broken, and, and this is an explanation of, of why. And it, it does this really intentionally. It, it talks about uh, the broken relationship that we have with creation or the earth, right? How many of you know, how many had a garden this year? Okay, how many of you still love crabgrass, right? No. Why, why, why am I so good at growing crabgrass? I can't grow anything else, but I can grow that, right? Weeds, right? The, we have this, this broken relationship with the earth. We have this broken relationship with each other, right? This, this enmity between, uh, between us and also broken relationship with God. And we see that at play everywhere uh, we look. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning, but I, I want to encourage you to listen in because the story of creation isn't just kind of a made-up fairy tale. We believe that this is the actual Account. If you're not a believer, maybe at the very least this will offer an explanation of why things are the way that they are. And, and I would encourage you to try to find another reason why things are the way they are. It's actually very difficult to do. And so the, the believers, so the Christians, will look to the God's Word and say, yeah, I think this actually explains the truth. It actually explains why things are the way that they actually are. Falling is uh, not a fun event. Uh, Alan Eustace set the current world record in 2014. I think he was almost in space. He fell uh, for 25.7 miles. I don't know how long that took him. That was a very long, long fall. There's a Serbian flight attendant who holds the Guinness Book of World Records for an accidental fall. The first fall was, was on purpose. She holds the world record for an accidental fall. She's a flight attendant. This might make you feel queasy. Um, she fell out of a plane, I'm assuming. Uh, she fell for six miles. So I think we honor her by saying how far it was. 6.31 miles. Yo. <laughs> I always tell people, if I can scream twice, the fall is too long, okay? If you have to scream, take a breath in, and then scream again, that's too far. Well, she survived. She did not attempt that again. There is also one more fall. I don't know the distance of this fall. It was uh, explained as a great fall. It was Humpty Dumpty. He didn't make it. <laughs> falling can be terrifying. Falling can be dangerous. Falling can be deadly. Uh, falling. How many of you have a story about falling? Slipping and falling? Do you remember the age that you got to when ice was no longer your friend? Remember when you were a kid and there was ice and you were like, yo, ice, and you would run and you would slide and it was fun. And then, I don't know, man, 35, 40, I stopped being my friend. I was like, look, ice, why am I on my back? I didn't, I didn't even know what happened in between. It can be dangerous. We all probably have a falling story. Um, we were with friends this weekend. They had a little one, and, and, and she was still kind of getting her legs under her. And it was funny how so much of our evening was consumed with making sure the baby didn't fall. You guys remember those moments where you're like, oh, you know, she would get near, you know, the steps, and, oh, you know, and we're all just kind of, you got those, those parental flinches, right, or you're trying to save, save the baby. When Adam and Eve fall, it is not just a physical fall. 
it's, and it's also just not a spiritual fall. It's also a spiritual fall. It, it is so much more than that. It, this is the type of fall of like, if you ever had someone in your life that had great position and had great power and had great influence and, and they had great moral status and, and they lost it all. This is, this is a, the, the fall of all falls. This is losing everything. This is losing spiritual uh, uh, value, losing uh, relational value, losing their position or their status uh, in, cre- in the creative order. They lost everything. They lost their environment. They lost their home. They lost so much. This is an incredible fall. And so why get into this? Why talk about the fall of man? Why talk about Genesis uh, chapter 3? Well, at the very least, I think it does provide an explanation. It explains to us why things are uh, the way that they are. And that's important because there's actually world philosophies out there that will tell you that people are basically good, right? They'll say, no, people are good. We're born good and, and we're good. You just have to educate them. And so I'd like to give a really academic and long explanation for how that's not true. People aren't good. Okay, ready? That, now we're done, right? They're not good. Look around. They're not good. If people were good, we wouldn't need stop signs, right? If people were good, there wouldn't be pickled beets. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they're, there's, people are not good. It's not good. Look around. It's not good. People are, are, are selfish, and we all are, and we're fighting, and we, we blame, and we backstab, and we lie, cheat, and steal. We do this, and we do it intuitively. No one has to train us to do that. It just is kind of there. And why is it there? Well, it's because of the fall. I think secondly, it it, it offers a warning to you and me. It's a warning to say, hey, look, this is the actual state and condition of things. The truth about your existence is that you're in a fallen state. Outside of Jesus, we're in a fallen state. We're separated from God. We're separated from the blessings of God. We're separated from the forgiveness of God. And it's not just a warning to beat you up or or to make a a loud noise in your life and to make you feel guilty. No, it's, it's actually the third thing is to offer hope. I think there's a little bit of hope in this story. In fact, we're going to get to a verse here at the end where we see that God shows incredible hope because guess who never leaves the conversation? God. He he never leaves Adam and Eve. Despite their choices and despite what they did, he never walks away. So we're going to open up to Genesis chapter 3 here starting in uh, verse 1 and we're going to pull out some, some, some important points to this discussion about the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says this, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? This is such an interesting question. Did God really say? Have you ever tagged a really on on the side of something and it just changes the whole formula of the sentence, right? Did God really say? But look what he's not doing. He's not denying the existence of God. He's not denying that God says things. He's not denying that God has said things to Eve, that there's a personal relationship there. Uh, He's not denying any of these things. He's actually just asking. He's just putting a little bit of a tweak on, on with this question. Did God really say Point number one is, is this, the fall of man broke our trust in God's word. Did God really say? You see, Satan was not after uh, facts here. He's not asking Eve to quote the command. What he's asking or what he's trying to do is poke a hole in her trust in God's word. If, she can, if he can get her just to mistrust God's word or maybe even her interpretation of God's word, he can, he can create just a little bit of distance between God's word and her life. That's all he's trying to do. He's just trying to create a little bit of space, trying to cause her to question her trust in what God really said. He's not after facts. He's after trust. This is interesting in verse 2 because the woman answers the question and she actually gets it right. The woman said to the serpent, we may, eat the, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And so, so she actually gets the answer to the question right. She knows the answer, despite the sight this question with the word really in there, trying to get her to mistrust God's word. She knows God's word. It's in her heart. She's in fellowship and communion with God. She knows what God has commanded, and so she answers the question correctly. Scripture goes on in verse 4, and this is where Satan just pulls out all the stops. He just, he just absolutely lies to her. He says, you will not certainly die. This is a complete contradiction from what God has said to be true. 
She says, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and and evil. Man, this is, this is such a powerful deception because it's, it's something that plays in your life and in my life as well. First of all, we're, we're tempted, aren't we, to not trust the Word of God, that, that maybe there's another source of information, maybe, maybe there's another reality that, that I should be listening to, I, another voice that I should listen to. But, but what Satan does here when he says that you will not certainly die, he says this, the fall of man broke our trust in his character, in whose character, in God's character. You will not certainly die. He's basically calling God a liar. You will not certainly die. What God told you isn't true. Your God is a liar. This creator that you think you know, he's different than you think you know. God's holding out on you. There's a better way. There's a more pleasurable way than God's way. If you would just go his way, it would be so much better. God's holding out on you. That's what he's like. He's, he's one of those gods. It's, it is, this is an, a, an accusation on God's character. And so, so Eve is, is now, she's, she's questioning uh, whether or not she can trust in God's word, and now she's questioning whether she can trust in God's character, which is crazy because God has provided for them at every turn, uh, at every corner. God's been pouring out his provision, uh, and yet, like, like all of us, Eve is tempted to deny that. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, we can stop there just for a second. All of the, all of the trees and the fruit in the garden were all like this. They were all good. They were all good for eating. They were all pleasing to the eye. So that's not a surprise. But also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And this is the fall of man. It's not so much about fruit or, or eating from a tree per se. It's about listening to another voice. It, it's about mistrusting the word of God. It, it's about denying the creator his character as truth giver and, and this honest, loving, powerful, caregiving creator. It, it's denying that. It's rebellion. It's, it's, it's actually seeking your own wisdom and, and, and following your own desires. She's, she's actually relating with her animal instincts, this material part of her creation, more than the spiritual part of her creation in this moment. She's coming out of agreement with God and into agreement with the deceiver, and she's trusting her own desires over the wisdom of God. I remember when I was like in, in high school, I was I was just, you know, I was in, I was in youth ministry, I was in youth group, and I'm, I'm trying to follow the Lord and honor the Lord, and I, and I realized a pattern in my own life, and this pattern um, is, is still at play at, in some degree, but I realized this pattern when, whenever I was tempted to sin or tempted to do something that I knew was wrong, the only way that I could do that is if I first convinced myself of two things, and so maybe you relate to this, maybe you don't, but I would, I would have to convince myself that number one, this won't hurt me. How many of you ever said that to yourself? This won't hurt me. This will harm me. And the second one was no one will find out. Th those were my two. If I could convince myself that this wouldn't hurt me and no one would find out, it was a lot easier for me to disobey the Lord and do whatever I wanted, right? But I at first had to say, hey, this isn't a big deal. This isn't a problem. I, I can trust my own advice, right? God's kind of holding out on me. This isn't a bad thing. This isn't going to hurt me. This is a temporary, momentary moment. It's not a big deal. This isn't going to hurt anyone else either because they're not even going to know. It's not going to affect me long term. This isn't going to be a problem. I always had to convince myself of those two things before I could ever disobey uh, God, that it would be safe and that it would be a secret, right? And, and this is what we do. This is what the fall of man is, is that, is that I believe that there's a different way that I can live my life other than what God has said, and I actually think that it's not going to be much of a problem. Number three, the fall of man caused us then uh, uh, to cause us to then trust our own desires over the wisdom of God, to trust our own desires over the wisdom of God. Adam was made from the ground and had the breath of God breathed into him. Eve was made from Adam. They are the most complete union of the material world and the spiritual world. And yet there was a, there was a, what took place in the fall was that instead of the spirit of God leading over their lives, then the natural order began, the material world, their animal instincts began to lead over them and they gave it leadership Instead of the spirit governing their bodies, now the body is governing the spirit. Don't we see this everywhere? We see humans just running around working off their own natural instincts, just power and pleasure 
uh, acting like animals, just, just seeking out the next thing that they think they need instead of seeking spiritual realities. Galatians 5, 16 uh, says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It goes on for 17, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing things that you want to do. We have these, these temptations. We have these urges now. We have these desires now that are outside the wisdom of God. That's because of the fall of man. Romans 8, 13 says this, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will, will live. And so now we have Adam and Eve, and they've sinned against God. They've, they've broken their covenant relationship with God. And what they're about to find out is their covenant relationship with one another and even the earth itself. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And this is where we kind of get into the meat of the morning. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the reality of the fall of man. It, it, it starts this cycle, and we talk about this in Restoring the Foundations, one of the ministries here at Petra. It's this shame, fear, control cycle. Shame, fear, control cycle. You've seen this all the time. We can use little kids to, to talk about it, but the little kid steals uh, the, the cookie from the cookie jar, and there's chocolate all over their face. And you say, did you eat a cookie from the cookie jar? And they're like, no. Right? And what's going on in a little kid's head? Their head, they kind of sneak around, right? And, and they know what they're doing is wrong, but they, they take it and they eat it and they feel ashamed. They, they feel bad for what they've done. And then they realize, oh my goodness, someone's going to find out. And so what do they try to do? They try to hide the evidence, right? So how do you hide? Well, the first way they hide is if someone asks you if you did it, you lie, right? You got to hide it that way. And then maybe if there's crumbs somewhere, you got to scoop those up. How many of you are really, I won't ask that question. All right, listen. Some of you are real good about hiding crumbs, okay? I'll use that term metaphorically. Hiding crumbs. Keep it a secret. If it's a secret, it's all good. If no one's going to find out, if, no one, if it's not going to hurt me, it's fine. And yet there's still this nagging shame. I know that I've done something wrong. Then there's a fear that someone's going to find out. And so I try to control by deleting my web history. It's, it's shame and it's fear and it's control and it's just this cycle that takes place, and it's constantly going on. Shame, fear, and control. This is interesting because we even see, by, 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 they realize they were naked. Again, this is, this is not just physical, but this is uh, spiritual. I, I know you disobeyed, and, and you know that I disobeyed, and I know that I disobeyed, and I know that there's a God, and I'm ashamed of what I've done, and I'm, I'm afraid of your judgments of me, and so now I feel like I need something between us. I need to cover it. I need to hide it. I'm I feel ashamed, and so I try to control by, by covering it. Verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, Where are you? This is, like a, a, this is an amazing and a really sad picture. We have Father God who... Uh, the text doesn't tell us exactly his habits, but it seems as though the way it's written is that uh, Father God comes in the cool of the day to walk with his children. Dad's home, you know. Got this dad, and he comes home, and he wants to see his kids. And Father God is, is walking in the cool of the day. This is the time that I spend with my kids, and, I'm, and he's calling for his kids. It's beautiful. This is the father we serve. And we know God knows all things, so we know he knows what's going on. But, but the way he approaches them is that he, he asks the question, where are you? And what a powerful question. Where are you? In fact, I think humanity has been trying to answer that question ever since the fall. Why do people have to go away after high school to try to find themselves? Even non-Christians do that. Because no one knows where they are. We, we feel lost because we are lost. And so God comes in with this powerful question, not just for Adam, but for all of us. Adam, where are you? Where, where are you? What, what have you done? And, and, and depending upon where you are, where are you going? Like, what is this going to lead to? He says, where, where are you? He answers, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I heard you in the garden. I remembered what I did. I was ashamed. And so I was afraid. So there was fear. And then I tried to control it by hiding. And he said, who told you you were naked? 
Who told you that, Adam? What, what voice goes back to the first point? What voice have you been listening to, Adam? Uh, I, I didn't tell you that you were naked. In fact, there are certain realities about the universe that I, I didn't actually want you to know. I wanted you to protect you. I wanted to protect you from all this evil. I didn't want you to be aware of that. And yet now you know. How do you know who told you that? Whose voice are you listening to, Adam? Who told you that? I didn't want you to know that. I wanted to save you from that. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And this is where the story gets really interesting because I've heard a couple of theologians say that, that this almost would have been an opportunity for Adam to repent, that he could have responded to God with repentance. And he could have, I, I don't know how that would have changed human history, but, but they said it's just interesting that he didn't do that. He didn't, he didn't in that moment just fall on his knees and say, yes, I did, I did that. But instead, he's now acting out of his new nature and tell me how familiar this sounds uh, for your house. He starts acting out of his new nature. He said, the woman you put here with me, and I'll stop right there because I know there's some husbands in this room, and you were thinking, no way he said that. <laughs> I would never blame my wife for anything. He's not just blaming his wife, though. He's blaming God. Look, the woman you, who's he accusing? He's like, this woman that you sent to me, I'm just over here on my little lonesome. I'm the innocent one. This woman that you sent to me, you put, her, you put her here with me. I was fine on my own. And there's blame. I haven't, had, I haven't heard anyone say this yet, so I don't know if this is re original with me or maybe I'm just late to the party. I feel like, man, th there is a spirit of blame over our culture, right? We've been fighting with each other, but how much of it is surrounded around blame? It's your fault. It's your fault. You voted for who? Is that too soon? Sorry, is that too soon? Is that, are, we, are we all right? Is everyone good? Are we okay? No one's leaving? Okay. It just, it's just this blame culture. I need someone to blame. It can't be me. It has to be you. Just remember blame ends with lame. Okay. It's the woman you put here with me. She gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. It's her fault. And so Adam, think of the three of them just sitting here. You got the man, the woman, and the, the serpent. And so God is, hears Adam's response and then he looks at the woman. He's, then God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Look, look it's not my fault, it's his fault. Look, I didn't make the serpent, you made the serpent. You put him here. This isn't my fault, this is your fault. This, he deceived me. So then God looks at the serpent and he asks a question of the serpent. What, do you, what have you done? It's really interesting because then what we find in the next several verses is that God deals with the serpent. Then he looks to the woman and he deals with the woman. And then he looks to the man and he deals with the man in the order that they blamed each other. And he says, no, there's a, there's a level of personal responsibility here. We won't get into all of the details, but there's, there's punishments that are handed out. They're necessary punishments. They're natural consequences of of disagreeing with God's natural order. The blame game, the blame game. As we close this morning, I, the question might be like, Brian, why talk about this? What, I think it's important to talk about this because one, it, it, at the very least, it offers an explanation. That this is the result of sin. Sin leads to death. When you choose it, this is where it leads. It destroys our relationship with creation. It destroys our relationship with one another, and it destroys our relationship with God. It's death. It's death. It's utter death. It's complete rebellion. It, it, it causes you to mistrust God's word. When he has spoken, we mistrust it. It causes us to mistrust his character. You can't possibly be like the way that you have said you are like. And it causes us to follow our own desires instead of his wisdom. We live out of this natural instinct instead of our spiritual realities. And man, I don't know how many times, even in leadership, we're, we're in meetings. And maybe for those of you who run businesses or, or moms as you're running families, don't you have kind of these, these knee-jerk go-to reactions to situations where you're like, you know, wisdom tells me, like my experience tells me that we should do this. And, and I'll just spit those answers out really fast, right? We're in a situation, uh, I, I got this, right? I got this. I, I, I know how to handle this one. Uh, we should do this. We do this every time. It works every time. Let's do this every time. And I found myself just saying, Lord, how much of that is, is like wisdom and experience over, over time? 
Or, or how much of that is just me just allowing my mind, my body to rule over me? How, how much, how often do I just say, hey, Lord, I, this feels like a layup. Like, it, this feels really easy. I feel like I got this. But what is the Spirit of God saying? The, the fall removed that inkling in our heart to say, God, what do you say? God, what is, what is your decision on this? What is your agenda? What do you want? What is, what's best for me here? The fall of man removes that instinct for us to go to the Lord. It, it, it separates us from him. It actually causes us to be guilty in his sight because we've rebelled against the creator of the universe. You have this God who's created everything. He gave them one rule, and it was for their own good. And they disobeyed, they rebelled. And that's the state of all of us from the moment that we were born, we were born into rebellion. And listen, this, this story, why tell this story? At the very least, it's an explanation. At the very least, it's a warning. But there's another reason to tell the story. Because the story ends with hope. The story ends with hope. On verse 21, I want you to watch this. And listen, again, you could skip over this real fast if you're not looking clearly. I want you to, I want you to don't just read the words, but hear what's happening. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. And he clothed them. And he covered it up. They tried to cover it up themselves. They made little fig leaf outfits and they were probably not very well made. And God said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you cover. And he clothed them. Some theologians believe this was the first sacrifice, a temporary forgiveness of their sins and awaiting Jesus to come. Look who never left the conversation. Look who never stops talking to his children. They just sinned against the God of the universe, the creator of everything, the one who has provided for all of their needs. And they listened to a different voice and they doubted his character and they went with their desires over his wisdom. And look who didn't leave. How many of us grew up in homes that one of the punishments was distance? Go to your room or mom and dad walk out of the house and they don't, they don't know when they're coming back. Look who doesn't leave. It's Father God. And what does he do? He says, I want to clothe you. I want to cover you. I see your shame. Let me dress you. Let me show that there's not only punishment coming, but there's also provision. I won't leave you or forsake you. I'm committed to you. I know that you broke your end of the covenant, but I will not break my end of the covenant. I love you. And we find as we continue to read Genesis that, that God starts to project a coming Savior that one day is going to reverse what was done. It's going to bring back this heart that loves God and trusts his word. It trusts his character and it trusts its wisdom. If you'll stand with me this morning, I'd like to close with a song. to sing a song together. It's actually a, a, a song of repentance or a song of dedication. It's this, it's this request to God that he would take our lives and that he would allow them to be consecrated to him. That he would, he would take them back. That he would forgive and that he would use what we have to glorify his name. And it, and it covers every area of life. Our, our, our mouths and our money and our our time and our energy, it really, it really does cover all those things. It's like a complete song of repentance. And we say, Father, I, I acknowledge that I have, I'm fallen. I acknowledge that I've walked away from you, that I've mistrusted your word, I've mistrusted your character, and I've mistrusted your wisdom. And yet I wanna come back. Let's sing this song together this morning. Take my life.
silver Take my silver Christ and the grace that he brings from dying on the cross for our sins, we're, we're still lost in rebellion. That Adam and Eve, they were, they were your representatives here on earth. They were put in charge. They had authority over creation and as such, they represented all humanity. And when they, when they agreed with Satan, when they agreed with sin, they, they plunged all of humanity, even humanity that was to come, into a life of sin, into a life of rebellion where our inklings and our, our, our reactions are not towards you, but they are away from you. And we're born that way. And we're so grateful that even in verse 21, there's a window of redemption. There's a window of grace, the grace to come in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we acknowledge the fall. We acknowledge the actual state and conditions of things that we are apart from you. We're so grateful for your word this morning. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, For if by the trespass of the one man being Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who received God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you for new life in you. We know that the road to salvation means us returning to trusting your word, returning to trusting your character, and returning to trusting your wisdom. Father, I pray that you would cause our hearts in a fresh way to be aware of our fallenness, but also to be aware of your grace, of your goodness, and the life that is in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, dismiss you here in just a moment. I'd like to ask if you, if you want to stay, these are kind of the these are kind of those sermons where sometimes the Holy Spirit will prompt some things, some adjustments that he wants to make. I just want to create space and time for that. If you'd like to stay, the worship team's going to continue to, put, to, pray, to play. I know that some of you do need to go. 
So we will dismiss you. Next week, we'll continue our series here in Genesis. Look forward to seeing you there. God bless you. If you'd like to go at this time, you may. If you would like to stay as well, we invite you not to stay. <laughs>